All right. Well, start this again. Hello, everyone. Um, good evening. On behalf of the LAM Foundation, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our Circle of Hope Transplant Support Program webinar. It was so wonderful just to see this rush of faces burst in here. Um, a number of familiar faces, a lot of new faces as well. And I'm delighted that you all could join us. We do have a fantastic and full agenda for you this evening. My name is Charlene Dunn. I am the patient outreach coordinator for the foundation and the coordinator of our Circle of Hope program. I'll be your moderator this evening. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to recognize and thank our generous sponsors, the Harold R. and Winifred R. Swanton Foundation and the National Disease Research Interchange, which many of us are familiar with NDRI. Uh, we appreciate their ongoing support of our educational programs. And I will say a bit more about NDRI later in our session this evening. As I mentioned, we do have a full agenda for you. We will begin with a presentation from the medical director of our Circle of Hope program, Dr. Dan Dilling, followed by Q&A with Dr. Dilling. We will then hear from a panel of three women who participate in our Circle of Hope program, each of whom is at a different stage in her journey with transplantation. And finally, we will wrap up the evening with a patient and family group discussion. Just a couple of really quick housekeeping items. We will not mute all microphones throughout Dr. Dilling's presentation. So if you have any questions, please pose your questions in the chat box. And then once we move to q and I will read your questions to Dr. Dilling. And to streamline this effort here, we do, we do ask that you reserve the chat box at this time for questions only. Also a reminder, we are recording the presentation portions of this evening's session. Um, if you do not wish to be visible on the recording, please take a moment now to turn off your camera. We will not be recording the group discussion later this evening and would invite you to turn your cameras back on if you're staying on for the group discussion. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Dr. Daniel Dilling is a professor of medicine at Loyola University Chicago Strict School of Medicine and is the medical director of the lung transplantation program at Loyola. He oversees an advanced lung disease program where patients with pulmonary fibrosis, as well as several other advanced or rare lung diseases are under the care of a multidisciplinary team. Dr. Dilling has been a lifer at Loyola, where he attended medical school and received all of his internal medicine and pulmonary and critical care training. His work at Loyola consists of patient care, teaching, administration, and research. In 2007, or excuse me, in 2010, he established the LAM Clinic at Loyola, where he continues to serve as director and now cares for well over 100 patients with LAM. Dr. Dilling is also a board member of the LAM Foundation. And as I mentioned previously, he serves as medical director for our Circle of Hope Transplant Support Program. Outside of medicine, he enjoys golf, live music, and spending time with his family. And is now one-year-old Bernadoodle, Ringo. We did have a picture, or a, a sort of picture of Ringo last year, and we'd hope to have another one this year. But uh, given the state of COVID and everything that's happening, we're going to give Dr. Dilling a bit of reprieve, and I'll I'll try to have a photo of Ringo by the time we uh, send out the, the live recording or the recording of this uh, evening's session. So Dr. Dilling, thank you for joining us this evening and we're delighted to have you and I will now turn this over to you. Thanks, Shar. that was really nice. And uh, I'm so glad to be here. And of course, I'm always so glad to uh, do what I can to enhance the education, understanding, and conversation for patients with LAM around issues that concern them, especially, well, at least for today, it's around lung transplant. Um, let me share my screen here. I purposely decided to keep the formal stuff on the short side, knowing that um, knowing that there's going to be a lot of good questions. I've seen some of the um, preliminary questions that have come through ahead of time, and it's a diverse a, uh, diverse uh, group of things that we're, I think we're going to be asked about and talking about. So uh, I think it's good to try and leave as much time as we can to get through it all. Um, and so can you see my screen OK, Shar? Add your head if you can. Yeah, OK. All right. 
So uh, the task today is to try and talk about lung transplant in the time of COVID-19. Of course, all of our lectures are in the hospital or some version of how COVID-19 has affected X, Y, or Z. So uh, again, with that today here in this group. So what has changed? What remains the same? Um, and uh, let's get into it. So the things that we're going to try and discuss today are um, what are some of the indications for lung transplant and LAM uh, altogether. And some of you who saw the, the webinar from last year, either live or in recording, may see some of the same discussions. I figured that um, you know it's it's a good way of introducing the discussion today and uh, and for people that hadn't seen it before and for reminder. What are some of the general outcomes with transplant and what are the ones specific to LAM? And then what are outcomes specific to LAM after lung transplant? Then here we are at what has COVID done to lung transplant volumes and recovery? Uh, do some people get lung transplant as treatment for COVID? We've all heard a little bit about that. And how does the pandemic affect donor considerations? Oh, finally, where do you go to get more information about lung transplant? So when is it time to have a lung transplant in LAM? I think it's uh, an, uh, quite uh, a topic to try to digest and people get confused and or they get mixed messages and they uh, have, uh, you know, uncertainties around when it's time. So we'll do our best to try and talk about that. And really the concept is that we're trying to find the window of time that's just right for someone to get listed and then have their transplant. And if we do it too early, um, you know, because transplant is a big surgery, tough recovery, lots of medications and some complications that can happen afterwards, doing it too early, as you see on the left side can, can actually lead to a premature death. So um, we really wanna stretch out the time ahead of a transplant, ahead of listing that a person can have, even if it's a time where there might be some limitations in quality of life, need for oxygen and other things, uh, we really don't want to transplant somebody too early. Um, we'd rather wait until the time is right. However, it's also good to have those first evaluations at a point when it is too early so that you're not in a rush later. You can have time then to uh, receive and achieve education around uh, items that you're going to need for later in your recovery. Uh, there, those that have had a transplant on our panel can talk about how important it is to have a good support team. And some people come to the to the clinic the first time with some inadequacies around their support team, and there are opportunities sometimes to enhance it um, with time. Uh, there might be some. Uh, nutrition issues, whether it's obesity or undernutrition, both of which that can be problematic in, in, your, in your likelihood of success with a transplant. And so coming in too early provides a luxury of time uh, to be able to lose needed weight, get in good shape and get fit for the transplant that you might need in the future. And it also um, allows some people who might be undernourished through their disease state or infections or other things to be able to boost their nutrition, their uh, overall um, health and fitness to be able to also from the other direction be, become ready and fit for the transplant and recovery. Some people might come with substance abuse or, need, uh, or addiction to tobacco that are problematic. In fact, they might even be absolute contraindications to going on the list. So getting in really early is sometimes very helpful in being able to work on those things and become abstinent in a way that makes you an acceptable candidate for the transplant later. And gosh, it's a big deal to get whipped into a new system to meet all these new people and a uh, new way of doing things and maybe not your same uh, warm and fuzzy lamb doctor you're used to or pulmonologist you're used to having. And so to have this different group of people, uh, if it's all quite sudden can be uh, harrowing. So it's really good to get in early so that you can at least come to know and for them to come to know you and uh, 
grow in your relationship so that you can um, use that relationship to have a really good recovery later. So all those things make it important to come too early to the transplant uh, clinic. So don't, don't feel like you have to wait until it's time to go to the transplant center. It's good to go early. And so under normal circumstances, we're trying to list somebody when we think it's uh, gotten to that balance of uh, uh, transplanting will lengthen life and uh, the disease state itself has limitations that might be in the two to three year range as best as can be predicted. So you're trying to get on the list at that, uh, at that point in time and get transplanted hopefully in that window because if you are on the list too long or you come to the table too late for the transplant listing, we can get into problems. Um, first of all, you just might not have time to get a donor. Sometimes uh, identifying a suitable donor might be hard in certain, in certain individuals because of antibodies you might have that make you hard to match to, or perhaps uh, short stature uh, is another thing that might uh, make it harder to find a suitable donor. So. Uh, it's good to get in early and get on the list at the right time so that you maximize your chance of finding that donor. And furthermore, uh, waiting too long or not getting transplanted during the window of time may lead to you being very sick at the point, maybe even too sick uh, to have a good recovery. And so it's really important to try and find this window. So when is the window? Well, uh, it's different for every disease and there are actually guidelines that we have from the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant around when to have a transplant if you have pulmonary fibrosis or cystic fibrosis or pulmonary hypertension. Now there aren't any that uh, in that guideline that are specific to LAM. LAM only represents about 1%, maybe even less than that of all transplants done worldwide per year or through history. So it's really, you know, it's not, it's not one of the ones that's going to have a, a major segment in the guideline or, or going to have robust information in databases to try and dictate when the time is right. But we can use, we can use uh, databases that do exist of um, cohorts of patients or groups of patients that have had a transplant who have LAM to try and um, construct for ourselves what are the typical uh, uh, characteristics of patients who have transplant. And so this is uh, one of those. And they looked at uh, 45 patients who uh, had a transplant for LAM, and the, they tended to have an uh, average FEV1 of about 26% of normal. Um, maybe if it was mixed uh, uh, obstruction and restriction, it might even be lower. The diffusion capacity, which is DLCO, uh, percent predicted from the pulmonary function test in the on average is 27 percent uh, the patients were typically on oxygen because their um, arterial blood gas oxygen levels were low with this 53 that's uh, abnormally low that's someone that needs oxygen so someone who needs oxygen someone who uh, might have elevated carbon dioxide the average wasn't elevated at 43 but um, uh, if if it were elevated that would be one more signal of, of uh, more severity. And then they, look at the, they looked at something called the MRC breathlessness score, where um, some of them were in the four or some of them in the five range. And, and that just for your um, understanding of what MRC breathlessness scale meant, uh, it was number four is someone who stops for breath after walking about a hundred yards or after a few minutes on level ground. And five might be someone who's too breathless to even leave the house or breathless with just like dressing and bathing and those sorts of things. But the people that might have a lower breathlessness score are people you know, and who by that, by one argument might be, uh, um, at least from this angle too early for a transplant might be someone who just walks slower or someone who's shorter breath walking up a hill or something like that, that you know, may, may not get you to that MRC breathlessness score of four to five. Uh, and then uh, oxygen, 93% of them were on oxygen at rest. So it, I'm not saying that you have to fulfill all of these things. Uh, this was just the averages from one database for patients who were transplanted with LAM. 
Um, but uh, these are this gives you a flavor of some of the features of the people that typically would have a transplant. And when you're coming to the clinic for the transplant evaluation, um, you should know what they're looking for um, because you want to put on your best face and make sure that you're providing them with the information that they're that they're seeking. So they're trying to find out: Are you sick enough to need it? So. You know, are you fulfilling some of those features that we just saw on the last slide, for example? Have you, I guess, looked at all other options for treatment? I like, are you using oxygen? Um, and is that, is that going to make you be less breathless? And uh, are you on Cirrolimus? Uh, because, you know, that might be something. I mean, I think these are things that would be uh, almost universally true in someone who's gotten to this point, but those are the kinds of things they're looking for. And in other diseases, there might be some other options to look at as alternatives to, to transplant. Uh, are you motivated and do you understand what you're getting into? So there are some people who come to the table or to the clinic, um, to the transplant table, sort of uh, un unaware or let's say naive about all that's involved. And that's okay to be naive. That's why you're coming to learn more. Uh, and but it but it's over time, your transplant center is hoping that they see um, a positive direction in you coming to understand and being showing your motivation that you are trying to really understand what you're getting into, whether that means your attention in a class uh, or whether it means your engagement in a support group meeting with the other patients that have had their transplant. So they, they really want to make sure that you're motivated and that you get it and that you're not, um, uh, let's say, uh, naive to some of the things that might happen. Uh, do you have any additional medical problems that raise your risk? So these might be things that are picked up through the initial history and physical examination and review of the tests that we've had before coming, or these might be evaluation of some of the tests that are done during the testing process before you go on the list. So looking for medical problems, for example, you know, someone who has, uh, who's found to have colon cancer, you know, that active cancer is not, not something that um, is going to lead to a good outcome if you have a transplant. So that, you know, that's one example, but looking for types of infections, looking for bad heart disease, kidney problems, those sorts of things. Do the tests that are done tell them something about how to do the surgery in your particular case? So there might be um, there might be things that they see on the scan that make them say, "Oh, this person really needs to make sure that they get both lungs out in a bilateral operation," or or maybe there's uh, uh, maybe maybe there are some features of your disease that make a single lung transplant more attractive. Um, so those, that's what I mean by how to do the particular case. Do you have an adequate support system? Uh, you definitely can't get through a lung transplant alone, um, and you can't use just hired help to, to get back and forth to the clinic and, and make it work. But you really need uh, a support system that is going to provide for physical and emotional needs that are going to come through after the transplant. I bet we'll hear about some of that from our panel. Are you at risk for stopping your medications or not showing up for tests or appointments? This is a big one. When you come to, when you come through the evaluations, if you're someone who seems not not to to be fully engaged with things, and uh, someone who you know, decides to do things their own way or misses appointments, these are um, it's 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 sort of a litmus test for how your how things are going to be after the transplant as well. And we know very well that people who don't do the right things or things that they're asked to do or show up for appointments and tests after a transplant are going to have problems. So it becomes a big red flag if you're somebody who uh, uh, doesn't do things the right way and, um, uh, does, uh, and doesn't follow through on, on uh, recommended treatments. Uh, lung transplant for lamb, um, we talked about some of this already in the previous uh, slide, but the indications are someone who has severe and life-limiting shortness of breath. It could also be someone who has pneumothoraces that are uncontrollable, although we tend to have other ways to get those under control, but um, theoretically that's uh, part of it. Um, 
and then we would almost universally have it be someone who needs oxygen for rest, not just for walking around or going upstairs. And that FEV1 of around 30% predicted and uh, around there is really uh, the truth of the matter. Some people at 30% have really good quality of life and limit and not much oxygen need and they can do okay. And, and others um, who are uh, at that level of FEV1 FEV might be much more limited and sick. And, and so yeah, that's, that's a rough uh, indi indicator of when it's time. Um, and then transplant programs will have to, I suppose, specifically look at some things around a lamb patient to be on the lookout for. So you might be more likely than some others to have problems with uh, pleural problems. So that means the pleural space, the area around the lung where fluid can develop, chylus fluid. So that can be a problem. Uh, you can have you have your angiomyelopoma uh, that are still there after the transplant. If you have them before the transplant, they don't come out. So uh, they can still bleed, they can still grow. Those are things that need to be reviewed and and uh, monitored. And there have been cases of lamb that recurs in transplanted lungs. Now the good news around this is that it's well several pieces of good news are that it happens only occasionally, I'd even say it's uh, somewhat rare within lamb transplants. Um, and when it does occur, it is almost always of a minor concern. It's a small amount of uh, lamb burden and cyst burden. Uh, and thirdly, it's generally going to be treatable with serolimus in just the same way as it is before the transplant or in, in uh, before the transplant, so uh, it's treatable, let's say. And so it's pretty unusual that recurrence of lamb in the transplanted lungs becomes a problem that is uh, either health or life-threatening, although it, it has happened once or twice, I think. And here's the, the real good news that we um, have here, and I'll show you some more data around this, is that lamb patients who have a lung transplant are really the best survivors of all diseases. It's be even better than cystic fibrosis, which um, a lot of people think of as a very good long lasting survival after lung transplant because they tend to be young people with limited other medical problems. And perhaps for the same reason, uh, it's true in lamb. So, um, there are data from uh, the past, a 2004 publication where it was only seven or 14 patients uh, compared to 399 patients who had other types of transplant, 100% survival at, uh, at the day of transplant, of course, and uh, five-year survival uh, typically for all lung transplants is uh, somewhere around 50 to 55%. And in, in, this, in this database, it was 69% of people live to that five-year mark. Uh, in another publication, looking at 57 patients with a, with a lung transplant from LAM, had uh, a 10-year survival that uh, is 75%. Uh, 75% of people live 10 years or more. And in other diseases, that tends to be about 30% of people living 10 years or more. So that's really good. And then uh, an even more recent uh, publication looked at uh, 134 patients in the database of the United Network of Organ Sharing, or UNOS. Over time, it was actually the period between 2003 to 2017. And patients with LAM, um, 134 of them, uh, this is, these are red marks just to look at uh, the survival product, Likelihood of survival of 100% at day zero, 50% for, for all transplants, like I said, is about five and a half years. 50% of people will live longer than that, which is, and some may, much longer than that. But look at for lamb, that 50% survival stretches way out to 12 years. And again, um, it, uh, that means 50% live beyond that and often many, many years beyond that. So really good news in survival after lung transplant if you need one for lab. And of course, we put it off as long as possible. 
I thought it would be useful to try and walk through what um, the procurement of organs is like. Um, so we you know, might start up here with a patient on the wait list. Um, this is uh, lungs, please come, and oxygen tank. So someone's on the wait list waiting for their lung transplant. And it might be waiting um, a month, and it might be waiting a year, and it could even be longer than that. Um, but one day the phone rings, and first the phone rings to our to the transplant center, nurses or doctors who um, are, receive a phone call from UNOS, or maybe even actually specifically one of the organ procurement organizations, the regional sort of organ banks or organ procurement organizations that uh, work sort of under the umbrella of UNOS in in fairly, uh, as fairly as possible, distributing organs to those in need um, and matching donors to recipients. So Gift of Hope under UNOS might make a phone call to a transplant center saying, we found an organ for you. This is what people I think don't realize. Um, and this is what I wake up at two in the morning for all the time. Um, we get When we get this phone call, it's, not just here's the here's the patient and uh, here's the donor and uh, you know take it or leave it uh, with no information. It's actually an enormous amount of information that's given on the phone or actually through a computer portal to about about the donor. So we of course know about the patient on the wait list already, and now we're hearing about the donor and we we get all kinds of information about their health history, their age, their mode of death, their um, uh, um, any complications that existed around the time of death or in the hospital stay that might have led up to death. And this is usually going to be a brain dead donor, someone who um, might have had a car accident or a, um, a stroke or something that led to a brain death. We get an x-ray, we get the CAT scan, there's a bronchoscopy done or a scope into the lungs and we get to either look at those pictures and we might even, uh, we might get to look at the pictures of that, but we at least get to hear about what they saw. We get to find out if there was any infection in the fluids that were um, obtained during that bronchoscopy. We get all kinds of blood tests. That's what this test tube is. We get all kinds of blood tests with information about the, the patient, the donor's oxygen levels, their kidney function, their heart function, all kinds of things. Um, and we get to find out what ventilator settings they're on. Um, and so it's really a robust amount of information that we get. And in this day and age, we're also finding out that they've had a negative COVID test. We, we've always learned that they have a negative HIV test and hepatitis test and, and uh, all kinds of other worrisome things that uh, you could imagine. But now we're also finding out that they have a negative COVID test. And that's true today. It wasn't true when the pandemic began in, in April, uh, May, March and April. Uh, the organ offers were coming with uncertainties around that, and that led to uh, a lot of uh, issues. So at that point, we accept the organ if we like what we've heard and we think the match is good and the size is right. And, and, uh, but you know what? It might be very far away. So we've got to hire, like we have a nurse whose full-time job it is to really just organize the logistics of all this and, and uh, basically hire an airplane and cars to take them to the airplane and go with a surgeon from our center, goes out to Nebraska or Arkansas or wherever they're going to go, and, uh, or maybe it's down the street, and they go um, to uh, uh, try to uh, assess and then obtain the organs for for a return home. But it's not just the lungs that are going, it's a heart and it's kidneys and it's um, lungs and a liver and there's also probably some other intestine and other things that could be uh, received. So uh, it's actually quite a logistical challenge of uh, bringing in a team for each of these that might be, be coming from different parts of the country, all to um, 
receive the organs and you can't just come whenever you feel like it and take your piece and off you go there's a specific order that this all has to be done in and it's really all has to be orchestrated in a you know in basically one procurement organ uh, one procurement operation that might take a couple hours but it has to go in a certain order and all the teams have to be there at exactly the right time to make it all work and and it always does happen that way but it it's amazing the logistics that are involved each of them with their own planes and cars and all this stuff So then uh, the organ preservation and transport is next. So these days there's some fancy things that are happening with organ preservation where this is lungs inside a hood where they might be uh, perfused, sent blood through, and they are ventilated with a ventilator blowing air through. And so they can be preserved in a, in a alive basically inside, uh, inside this dome and either in a portable unit or maybe in a unit that you put them in when you get back. To, to your hospital and you can further assess the health of the lungs under this hood. Or sometimes it's the old fashioned way where literally we're putting them into a bag of ice and uh, bringing them home in, in the igloo cooler. Uh, so then of course they have to get another car and another airplane to bring them back. And then the operation starts. And, and by the way, actually the operation starts before this, before the organs get back because way back over here during the organ procurement operation, there's a phone call made back to the surgeon back at the home hospital saying, okay, it's definitely a go, we like the lungs. And so then the, or the, the, the scalpel starts back at the home hospital, even while the organ procurement is happening maybe a few states away. And it's all timed perfectly so that when the organs and the cooler enter the operating room, the first, lung has, is just coming out of the chest and they're basically ready to receive that and put it in so that no time is wasted um, with that organ uh, on ice as, as limited as possible. So it's, it's, I think it's quite, it's quite an orchestra and I think uh, people don't always appreciate all that goes into making it all work. Okay, so on to the sort of the topic of tonight that we were tasked with, which is uh, trying to talk about how COVID-19 uh, has affected lung transplants. And this is a story in development still, of course, um, as we've gone through the first wave and we're now entering the second wave. This is a heat map of COVID-19. Um, it was, I think this is last week's map, but uh, this was average daily cases per 100,000 people. So population centers are gonna have uh, a bit more, I think, but this, shows you what we've been going through in the Midwest. Some of you on this call might live in other parts of the country or other parts of the world. You might have similar phenomenon or you might be in, in less hot places, uh, but it has been really difficult lately with the, just the regular care of COVID patients in the hospital and, uh, and then furthermore in trying to care for lung transplant patients and do new lung transplants. And here's actually what happened over the course of the last six, well, longer. this is what happened in the first phase of the pandemic in the spring. So this is number of transplants happening by month, according to data from UNOS, know, from the United uh, Network of Organ Sharing. And you can see that uh, this, this line is March of 2020. And if you went back in time 12 months, you could see that they're typically about somewhere between 225 and maybe 200 and 250 lung transplants done every month around the United States. And that's a pretty flat line. In fact, there was even a little blip up um, just early in 2020. And then look what happens in March of 2020. The number goes way down just over, so maybe 125 or so, and it slowly creeped back up and this is an incomplete month, so it hasn't really dropped that much, but, um, but it might. Um, but, um, but also it might not as much. I'll, uh, I think this happened because of the uncertainty as the, as the pandemic began about how to manage a hospital with COVID and have enough ICU beds and have enough ventilators and have enough ECMO machines, enough, um, and, 
furthermore, not having adequate testing. So we, uh, it was impossible, as I said earlier, to, to get COVID tests on some of, the, some of the donors, many of the donors, at first all of the donors. And so to imagine taking um, a donor that may or may not have COVID in a pandemic that was just starting and where we didn't understand some of the uh, phenomenon, it was, uh, it was daunting to imagine doing a lung transplant. So I think those that were done, that you can see over 100 were done that month, it was probably in places in this country that had really low uh, burdens of COVID. So they maybe felt less, less worried about it in, in particular areas, but it certainly led to a drop in volume around the country. But interestingly, it was not because of limitation in donors, because actually this is the number of donors per month, according to UNOS, uh, over the last uh, year and a half or whatever. And you can see that actually the number of donors actually hit a, hit a peak, uh, a, 12, a one year peak in March, and it's pretty much stayed above uh, a baseline level of donors. So UNOS is seeing more donors this year than ever before and so I think that's not because of COVID. Um, in fact, it's just despite, of, it's despite COVID. There might even be more donors than this if there hadn't been a COVID outbreak. So I think, um, uh, you know, it, it, in other words, the drop in transplants wasn't because of fewer donors. So what are, what are so I, I, I've spoken about some of the concern, the, a couple of the concerns uh, around testing, but I just wanna outline for you especially if you're somebody who's on a list at a transplant center or going through workup at a transplant center and they're starting to tell you, you know, we're going to put this, um, we're going to put this on hold for a while, or we're going to try and um, uh, wait to transplant you until some of this stuff is over. And you may say, well, gosh, why do that? If you've got testing and you can prove that the donor and recipient don't have uh, COVID, why not go for it? Well, first of all, Recipients might get sick on the wait list for, with COVID and, and that's just the general worry, but it's also a worry as they come into the hospital for their, for their lung transplant. We actually brought someone in for a lung transplant a few weeks ago um, and uh, the swab that we did as she entered the hospital, um, not a lamp patient, the, the swab that she, entered, that she had as she entered the hospital was positive for COVID unexpectedly. And so uh, she, uh, she was not uh, very sick with it, thank goodness, but she obviously, we didn't want to do a transplant in that scenario, so that can happen. Um, the donors might have COVID, I said that already, and it's uh, of course true. Um, and it's uh, as, as uh, the prevalence of the action goes up, it becomes even more possible. And a test is helpful, and I'm, I'm really glad we have adequate tests and fast tests and reliable tests nowadays. Um, but they're not 100%, and there is a possibility of having a donor negative for COVID who really does have it, and perhaps the test just, or you know, they had it so recently that the test is not yet positive. Um, it's not our major concern, but uh, our procurement teams on all those airplanes, going all those places, walking through strange hospitals, meeting all these other people from strange hospitals that are all there for the same purpose. Like that's a, that's a mix of people um, all in healthcare that uh, can get exposed, can get sick, and maybe even bring that back to their home hospitals and get patients sick. So there's, there are ramifications to it that um, are, discomforting. They're not enough to, to not do transplants, but it's discomforting. Then after the transplant, recipients can acquire COVID during their recovery. And that might be recovery in the hospital, you know, through the care of patients uh, from, you know, hospital workers who are caring for COVID patients one day and maybe the transplant recipients the next day or something like that. They're or, or, or hospital workers who might even acquire it in their, in their personal lives, they can bring it to the hospital. And even with the use of protective equipment, there's some concern of, of passing infection onto immunosuppressed people. So that's worrisome. Uh, it could 
But then even after the hospital, it can be in the clinic coming and going. There's a lot of visits after a lung transplant. It's uh, weekly for a while and maybe more than that if you're seeing some other specialists and such. So a lot of visits back and forth in and out of uh, lobbies and cars and maybe even public transportation or family members that are bringing you back and forth. So there's, there's the realistic possibility of acquiring the infection and recovery that way too. And then you might have rehab specialists coming to help you after your transplant in your home. They might also uh, bring it uh, with them. Um, and then daily life, the visitors coming over, family members who are trying to help care for you. Um, we all think we have a bubble, but you know, bubbles are very imperfect, I would say, uh, because there tends to be uh, some, some uh, uh, overlaps with other people's bubbles and pretty soon it's a very big bubble. And then as we're trying to avoid all these uh, possibilities of, of, of passing infection on to our patients, then we, we might modify the way we care for them. Maybe we'll see them a little less often to try and reduce their number of visits. Maybe we'll skip a bronchoscopy to try and reduce the chance of, uh, of, of something happening with the bronchoscopy. Perhaps we'll modify the medications in some way to try and reduce their chances of acquiring infection. Well, you know what? We do all those things for a reason because they work. And if you modify um, uh, a, a fine-tuned machine, it, it might not work as well. So there, that's a problem in, in its own right. And so with all of those things in mind, maybe there are some people who can wait. Uh, you know, this is, we, we have vaccines that are being announced on a weekly basis now. We're talking about, um, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There will be an end to this pandemic. And for people that maybe can wait and stay in their transplant window, uh, it might be a really good idea um, to uh, not, not uh, take the risk of having a transplant in the midst of, uh, of the COVID pandemic. Now, that's a judgment call because, um, you know, how do you know that you can wait or you can't? And that might take some special amount of monitoring. That might take some very complicated conversations and certainly expert assessment by your transplant team. What about lung transplant for COVID? I, you know, this sort of doesn't apply to this to this group, but I think it's uh, uh, it falls into the to the lecture anyway. So we're we're hearing about this. Um, so the indications for a transplant for COVID itself would maybe be someone who's in a non-salvageable situation. So someone on extracorporeal membrane oxygen oxygenation, which is a, a like a, a heart lung machine. It's like more advanced than just being on a ventilator to keep you alive. Uh, and our hospital has a few uh, such COVID patients right now and um, most uh, hospitals do. So perhaps one of those patients who we don't think is gonna get through the recovery and get better without a transplant, that might be an idea. Uh, we would probably be thinking about this in people that are younger in age and who don't have other medical problems and whose hospitalization and complications in the hospital are all focused on just the lung, like maybe someone who hasn't gone into kidney failure, someone who isn't having heart problems, and uh, maybe someone who uh, still is strong enough to go through with it. And of course, we wouldn't um, cut corners on other requirements for a lung transplant. So someone who is going to have a COVID a transplant for COVID, lung and lung disease is going to need to still meet other requirements. And, but there are concerns. So we wouldn't want to transplant someone with active COVID virus. Um, we wouldn't want to have uh, you know, immunosuppression afterwards would be concerning. We wouldn't want to, um, we, we have concerns around muscle wasting. So some of these people that are in the hospital so long with this situation where we've been trying and waiting for them to recover from their COVID pneumonia and on, on uh, ECMO machines and everything, they, they're on their back for a long time. They're not up and walking around. And so they get muscle wasting, they get weak, they get almost, uh, almost paralyzed from being so weak. And to imagine 
having a transplant and being strong enough to pull through and uh, rehab afterwards is uh, a big question mark and, and one that I think uh, sometimes makes the idea of doing a lung transplant for COVID unattractive. Uh, they also might get kidney failure, renal failure from having gone through such a critical illness. And then you know what? Uh, a patient who's gone um, through COVID pneumonia to the point of being on an ECMO machine probably is not conscious anymore. They're not awake and alert. They're not able to tell the transplant team, hey, yes, I want a lung transplant and I understand what I'm getting into and I um, agree to do all the things that one's supposed to do to stay alive afterwards. And so without that patient awareness, um, it becomes a very complicated decision to do a transplant. And so uh, that's uh, another issue. And, and then there's still the issues of transplantation in a pandemic. Um, so uh, access to all the um, testing and hospital clinic safety of staff even. So those are, uh, that's it. But here is a, a picture of a COVID pneumonia lung from the first transplant that was done in the United States for such a purpose. Um, um, I should have put a comparison of what a nice pink lung should look like, but uh, this is a very ugly looking lung, so I don't think it was going to recover. Um, so uh, with that all said, there are some other places you can get more information for about lung transplantation. Um, oops. Um, there are some uh, great transplant websites and uh, this is actually a video. There's actually two videos of this patient of ours who speaks about uh, and video follows her around her first year after transplant. And then we have a follow up one five years down the line. She describes what it's like to have a lung transplant in about uh, two videos that are maybe 20 minutes long each. And so it's uh, really uh, eye opening, but there's a lot of other ways to learn, including listening to our guest panel that is about to teach us some things. So. Thanks for your attention. Um, and I think we're going to do some Q&A next, right, Sean? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Dilling. Super informative. I'd like to invite you at this point, if you have questions for Dr. Dilling, to go ahead and type them in to the chat box. And we will be uh, watching that. And while you do that, Dan and Dr. Dilling, I was going to start with one of the questions that um, we had submitted prior to our mm -hmm. webinar this evening. Uh, the first question, I am a sporadic LAM patient, four and a half years post-transplant, uh, double lung recipient from Barnes Jewish Hospital. And this is pertaining to the vaccine. Is it safe to take the COVID-19 vaccine for immunosuppressed people? I do not understandably want to do anything to kickstart my immune system into possible chronic rejection of my lungs. And, understanding that there's much to be learned yet about this. Do you have any thoughts this evening? Yeah, I think the first thing you said is really important that there's a lot to be learned yet. But uh, if we can adopt uh, what we already know from uh, like flu vaccinations, um, we uh, very typically do give patients with lung transplants the, the flu vaccine, realizing there may be a little bit of triggering of the immune system and for those in the audience that um, are new to this topic, the idea of triggering an immune system in someone who's had a lung transplant is a bit uh, worrisome because the immune system is what we're trying to reduce with the immunosuppression medicines. And, um, and triggering the immune system theoretically could uh, uh, trigger acute rejection. Um, so, uh, but that's not something we see with flu vaccinations. Um, in fact, we give other kinds of vaccinations after lung transplant as well. Well, we don't, um, uh, I think we see the benefits uh, outweighing those theoretical and very small potential uh, issues. Uh, I think we would see the same, we would say some of the same things with, with this, that the, the benefits are gonna outweigh the, uh, outweigh the potential downsides. So I would, I'm going to advocate for all my patients to receive the, uh, an approved COVID vaccine once, you know, once we've gotten the, the, uh, the uh, uh, 
word of approval from Dr. Fauci, then we can go ahead and take it. Great, thank you. Uh, I know that's answering a question for a lot of our listeners tonight. I think I, that came in about time seven. So <laughs> thank you very much for starting out. I, we have one question in the chat box, uh, going back to one of your slides about um, the number of, it was the slide about the number of donors through COVID, the, the graph that you had. And the question is, if one lung was offered to two transplant centers, would that count as two referrals on your slide? Or is, or is that? Uh, let me think of this. Of the, uh, that was the number of, the, the two slides with, with volumes were, one of them was the number of transplants and the next one was the number of donors. Mm -hmm. So uh, those were number of, operations that were done so that, that if someone had turned it down that wouldn't be counted and the second the second slide with those um volumes was uh the number of donors so those were whole human beings who were being a donor for all kinds of organs so i'm hearing one so karen am I, is that are we answering your question here i'll go ahead and can you just type in a yes or a no for me here uh, and while she while she does that, oh, we'll go ahead and um, move on to another. Here's another question from the chat box: Is it safe, or what is your recommendation in terms of visiting our clinicians right now, seeing in clinic, or should we just wait if it's a standard yeah, checkup? I, I think that that is the question about whether it's safe to go to doctor visits right now is um, is a, a moving target meaning it might be different in different parts of the country, even different parts of a, a region, and from week to week, it's going to change. So um, uh, we're literally this today, we had um, some decisions made by our team to flip a lot of our patients for the coming weeks into uh, telehealth visits uh, when possible, or reschedule them and other times later, if that's uh, a feasible idea. Uh, and that's here. Um, that might be very different in a different part of the country, or there might even be some subtle differences in judgment um, down the street at a different hospital or down the hall with the, the, the kidney program. Like, I think, I think that's, there, there are, there, there, there aren't easy rights and wrong answers, right and wrong answers here. But with regards to lung transplant, I think of it this way. This is an immunosuppressed population of people with lung disease, which is the target, the main target of this virus. So um, I, uh, I think this is a very, I think lung transplant or advanced lung diseases of all sorts are kind of a, uh, a different conversation than might be for other, other patients in the hospital or other patients in the different kinds of clinics. Okay, understand. Thank you. Uh, we have a, another one in our chat box here. I'm wondering if lungs are shared between Canada and the US. Um, and it's a two-parter also. I've escaped and my chauffeur is driving me home. Uh, so it, the United States won't share its organs outside the United States unless um, unless it's been turned down everywhere in the United States. And then, uh, and this happens sometimes, uh, the Toronto program, which is a very good lung transplant program and has, um, let's say, some special tools to assess marginal lungs and make decisions that they might be okay. Um, they bring lungs back home, in other words, and uh, put them in a machine and reassess them. Uh, I showed a little picture of that. They're really good at that. They're the pioneers of it. So, um, yeah, it happens, but it but uh, but the first priority is always within the United States. Right. Thank you. And and it, this is a, a two-parter, and and also this patient saying thank you very much for your presentation. So, also she's asking, um, is it okay to have a, a male donor? For a female recipient, um, just yes, talk a little bit about that. Yes. Yes, there, there, there actually, there aren't any concerns in that in either direction now. And another question. These are great questions, you guys. Keep them coming, and we're just all over the map for you, Dr. Dilling. So, where in the transplant evaluation process do you learn about your antibody count? 
Uh, well, antibody count, uh, I, I presume they're talking about something called the HLA antibodies, which is um, uh, um, something that you can acquire during your lifetime, usually through a pregnancy, although it could also be through blood transfusions. So exposure to somebody else's genetics in, the, in, in one shape or another. Um, so uh, those, those uh, so it's more common in women, as you might imagine, to have uh, these HLA antibodies that might limit your donor pool, um, the number of donors that you can receive from. So you learn about that during the, probably the first round of blood tests in the, after you've uh, started the testing towards a transplant. Very good, thank you. And um, circling back, Karen did say yes, you answered a question about that previous graph. And along that, uh, going back to your presentation, uh, we have a question about the MRC scale and mm -hmm. wondering if, is that on or off oxygen? Yeah, I think that's done. I think that's with adequate oxygenation. So on oxygen, in other words. If needed. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I'm going to jump back to one of our submitted questions um, really quickly. We have, um, and I know this participant was able, was able to join us tonight. Is it possible in a lamb patient who's post-transplant for a lamb to come back in her abdomen? And if so, and treatment is necessary, what might that type of treatment be given that she's already immunocompromised? Yeah, so in fact, if, if lamb does come back after a lung transplant, it didn't come with the lungs. It came, it was, it was existing already in, in, in the woman somewhere. And it's mo and most likely it would have been in the abdomen somewhere in the first place, perhaps more microscopic than than uh, was known, or perhaps uh, it was known and, and just accepted as, um, as something that was going to be watched. So if abdominal disease did become problematic after a lung transplant, it would probably be treated with an mTOR inhibitor, so either um, sirolimus or everolimus, which, as many of you know, those drugs are really anti-rejection transplant medicines that were developed for kidney transplant. And so uh, we actually used it those drugs in lung transplant too, totally separate from lamb. People who might have had cystic fibrosis or emphysema, they will get, some of them will get uh, later on in recovery, they'll get uh, serolimus or everolimus as part of their treatment plan in some cases. Great, thank you very much. Um, another question about uh, recurrence of lamb. If uh, in transplant recipients who have had lamb return in their lungs. How soon does that, to the best of your knowledge, does that typically recur or, or show up? I think there's variation of when that shows up. It's going to be years down the line. I mean, it's not going to be like uh, the first uh, couple of biopsies or something, but um, probably within a couple of years, if it's going to happen, it'd be either a couple of years or it might be 20 years later. Great. Um, but that. again, it's usually not, it's almost never. Uh, a serious problem. Great, Andrew. thank you. I know that that's a question we have a lot of um, patients have, have asked over time. So thank you. Uh, we have a, about three more here, and I'll and I'm going to jump back over to the um, the submitted questions, and then we'll we'll move forward. You guys, I think we'll go ahead and kind of cut the questions in the chat box at this point. If there's anything that we didn't get to tonight, uh, please feel free to um, send them off to me in an email, and we'll do our best to get everything answered. Uh, one more that we have. Um, what do you think about a single lung transplant in patients over 70, lamb patients over 70 years old? Yeah, uh, it's sort of two questions because uh, what do you think of a single lung transplant is fine for some patients. You know, I have, I have patients who had their single lung transplant 20 some years ago, so they're, and they're doing fine. So a single lung transplant in, uh, uh, can be a, a great operation for somebody. And that decision is made um, kind of individualized uh, decision uh, by the transplant team after they go through all the testing. And then can a person over 70 have a lung transplant is I suppose another question. Um, and uh, it, it does raise the risk when you're over 70. Uh, that's an age group that doesn't survive as well as uh, uh, younger age groups. It's not a surprise probably. Um, but uh, but there's it's probably more than just uh, 
uh, actuarial tables saying that 70 year olds don't live as long as 60 year olds because I think it's also something about uh, the other health issues that are more likely to develop and that would accelerate with all the immunosuppression or going through surgery, uh, kidney issues especially, and, uh, and, and maybe just not as much resilience for being able to get through a big issue, whether it's the transplant itself or a rejection episode or a pneumonia that might happen or some other complication. So um, for those reasons, it's um, the age has to be taken as a factor but uh, age of 70 or 71 or 72 is not uh, a no-go for a transplant. It is in some centers, but it's not um, sort of universally a no-go. Um, single lung in that age group is probably going to be the best operation most of the time because it's a smaller operation that's a little easier to go through for someone who might not have as much resilience. Thank you. So two more for you and we'll let you off the hot seat for now anyway. <laughs> um, there's an interesting question here about pediatric lungs. Um, should a set of pediatric lungs be um, offered to an adult? Would those lungs continue to grow? Yeah, I saw that question. I like it. Um, <laughs> it's a very hard question to answer because yes, it, I think they would grow. In fact, uh, um, um, I've, I've met patients who were babies when they had their lung transplant and they're now older and their lungs are not baby sized so yes it happened i guess it i'd never thought about it before i love that question <laughs> that's good um yeah all right and finally i'm going to skip back to our uh, questions previously submitted and you talked about um, the procurement process a little bit and the distribution of lungs uh, this patient writes, my transplant center shared that the organ procurement and transplantation network is developing a more equitable system of allocating deceased donor lungs. The new approach being that continuous distribution will provide organ offers by considering all factors that contribute uh, to a successful transplant all at the same time. Could you briefly explain how this new approach differs from the current approach when it might be implemented, as well as your thoughts on how this will likely impact women with LAM who are active on the transplant list. Yeah, so uh, this has been um, an issue that's changed a couple of times in the last uh, five years or so. Um, and so the old fashioned way of doing things was that, uh, similar to the United States offering in the United States before it offered to Canada, uh, Gift of Hope, which is the Northern part of Illinois, would keep all their organs within Gift of Hope region unless everyone turned them down and then they'd be able to go to other OPOs. And that led to some people being uh, upset um, and it was in a way unfair, especially you could imagine two OPOs being separated by a river and uh, you know someone very sick on one side of the river is in the wrong OPO for a perfect donor on the other side of the river and it goes to someone who's not very sick because they're just within the same OPO. So that was a problem. And, uh, and with that problem in mind, they, they changed once a few years ago into something where it wasn't divided by OPO, organ procurement organization region anymore. It was concentric circles of 500 miles. And the idea being that you, you don't wanna, if you just opened it up to the whole country, then all of a sudden, everybody's got to take these flights cross country and it leads to longer times of organs on ice and more expensive, more expensive than all the flights that all around that, you know, when it might be suitable for uh, a, a donor and a recipient in the same hospital or down the street where it's um, just a lot logistically much more easy. So to try and balance the justice of giving it fairly to the person who's the sickest and uh, but also not burdening all this there's this really complicated system that's going into place probably in the near future who where um, it's going to sort of not be a circle of 500 miles but there's going to be sort of points allocated to how far away you are or how close you are i mean to the donor as well as how sick you are to try and make this sort of balance between distance and um, and uh, allocating to the sickest people. So it, it's really complicated uh, computer algorithm to try and take that into balance. And uh, I think it's gonna be the fairest thing, 
but I also it, it also may affect some of the people that aren't quite as sick uh, because suddenly these very sick people on ECMO machines, sometimes far away, are going to uh, receive all the first calls for a lot of organs. And so, especially within the lamb community, it may be something that uh, makes it a bit more difficult to get organs because you guys tend to be more stable people on the wait list that are um, usually not as desperate as some other people that might be at the ends of their ropes. Right. Thank you. A very thorough answer. Do you know, Dr. Dealing, where in the implementation process is this fairly new? That this uh, it's. I think it's still in in its like discussion and uh, fine tuning process. So I, I perhaps I should know, but I don't know when it's gonna when it's expected to be implemented. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, excellent presentation and. And I just want to say, uh, this is amazing to be able to sit here across all the miles and be able to feel, ask our questions to you directly, get such expert responses. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. And thank you yeah. all for the very, for your attention, but also for all the great questions and nice comments in the chat. Thank you. Lots of great questions in there. And we'll, we'll circle back to those. Thank you very much. Uh, so at this point in the evening, I'm going to, uh, if I can bring my, my screen up here one more time. And All right, can you see a slide there? Are there blank slide? Yes, Dan, can you see it? Yeah, thank you. Well, at this point in the evening, I would like to take just a couple of moments to recognize and celebrate uh, what I am calling our class of 2020 transplant recipients um, throughout all the, the chaos and the kind of tumultuous nature of this year. We have six women who um, did receive that call for transplant this year. And I wanted to just take a couple of minutes and, and recognize them if we could. I, I do know that we have, I believe, three of them on the call with us this evening. Um, we started with a cluster of patients receiving the call in February, beginning with Erin Zutrine, who received her transplant on February 16th at uh, University of Washington Medical Center out in Seattle. And Erin Aaron is on the call with us tonight. And Lauren Gavitt came just five days later. She received the call from San Diego and received her transplant on February 21st. And then just one week later, uh, Teresa Stoker, received that same call from Emory and received her transplant on February 28th. And we had a, bit of, a little bit of a lull, not long, but short. And on June 6th, Valerie Delson received her, her phone call from Brigham and Women's out in Boston. And then this August, we had our second transplant out at Seattle with Char Van Winkle receiving her transplant on August 21st and followed, oops, I lost my mouse, there we go, and followed just six days later by Laura Wolfson, who received her transplant at Langone in New York on August 27th. And I just want to say, I, I can report that I've been in touch with these women. They're not always without challenges, but they are all doing very well this evening. And I believe we have Erin, Shar, and Laura on our call with us tonight. So we'll have a chance to hear from them and uh, say hello a little bit later when we move into the group discussion. And one thing I want to add, add here is each of these six women, as they were receiving the gift of life, as we call it in, in transplant circle, um, they were also giving the, the gift of tissue donation to our LAM investigators. And through these six women, we were able to obtain fresh tissue samples, or 19 fresh tissue samples. And these tissue samples are, are key right now when you hear us talk about um, single cell RNA sequencing, um, it, it's just fabulous. So that's 19 samples that went directly to our investigators. We also had four fixed tissue samples that got out. These are typically used for pathological analysis where the fresh tissue samples are typically used for live cell analysis. And we were also able to obtain four blood samples from this group. And it's, some of you have heard me say this before, but you know, when you reach the point of transplantation, 
really their lung tissue isn't serving our bodies very well on a day-to-day -day basis. But as far as our, our investigators are concerned, um, this tissue is like gold. And earlier this evening, I mentioned NDRI, or the National Disease Research Interchange. And they are the organization with which we collaborate to make all of this happen. And we really couldn't do it without them. Ladies, thank you. Um, congratulations. This, this is the type of engagement and proactive action that is driving our LAM research forward or powering our LAM research, as we call it. It's no easy task to be juggling all that's going on in your mind when you're in evaluation for transplant and going through this. But um, filling out that paperwork, NDRI is fantastic about making it happen pretty smoothly and um, giving this gift to, to move research forward for all of us is, is just tremendous. So congratulations to all of you and thank you. And Aaron and Shar and Laura, we look forward to hearing from you um, later this evening in the, in the group discussion. And yeah, let me stop sharing there. Um, and finally, what I would like to do now is move us toward our panel discussion. I've asked three women who participate in our Circle of Hope program each of them uh, is at their own particular place in their LAM journey with transplant and, excuse me, and I've asked them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what the experience has like, been like for them. They are all open to questions and we'll be willing to take those in the group discussion later this evening as well. So with that, Karen Kinsey, if you would like to unmute yourself, or Julie, okay. if you, there she is. Um, Karen is going to talk to us a little bit about what it's like to be on the early side of transplant and going through that early evaluation and what she's learned from that. So Karen, thank you for being here. Sure, my pleasure, sure. Hi everybody, my name is Karen Kinsey and I live in Falls Church, Virginia, about 20 minutes from NIH. I was diagnosed 18 years ago at age 45 following my second VATS surgery for a lung collapse. At that time, they also did a lung biopsy and a top pleurodesis. The pulmonologist assigned to my case had been a researcher at NIH with Dr. Moss. So he had contacted Dr. Moss who accepted me into the NIH's LAM protocol before I received my LAM diagnosis. My first visit to NIH was in early 2003 and my most recent visit was just last month. In 2011, I began using supplemental oxygen and began taking Rapamune. By 2017, I was using supplemental oxygen 24-7. In December that year, my pulmonologist recommended that I be evaluated for transplant at two different centers in Virginia, as my DLCO was at close to 30% and my FEV1 was about 55%. Both of these centers perform about 25 lung transplants a year. By early 2018, I started the evaluation process and learned, um, surprisingly, that I have an extremely high level of antibodies, or HLA antibodies, which significantly reduces the likelihood of my finding an, a compatible donor. As it was explained to me, 96% of the potential donors are incompatible. In addition, my blood type is B negative, further impacting the potential donor, donor pool. I will say that one of the benefits of being evaluated at two centers concurrently is their willingness to share test results, which kept me from having to repeat every single test, which is a blessing. And I consider the willingness of the centers to share information a really huge benefit. It continues today and they um, are always quite pleased to be getting my data from NIH. Due to my high antibodies and the difficulties and risks that that presents, I've also been evaluated at two different centers in Pennsylvania. One of these centers performs over 100 transplants a year, and this center rejected me, citing my high antibodies. And the Japanese LAM study showing that LAM women often stabilize once a woman goes through menopause. The other Pennsylvania center performs about 85 lung transplants a year. And at this center, they do a desensitization protocol whereby they clean your blood 
in an attempt to reduce the level of antibodies and increase the chances of finding an acceptable donor. However, there is no guarantee that this protocol will be successful and the number of patients that they have treated with this protocol is actually quite small. I think in the last couple of years, there were four. Two were successful and two were unsuccessful. Given the time commitment involved in this protocol, which is 16 days in hospital, and the cost, the center requires that I agree to be listed for transplant should the protocol be successful. The, sen the success of this desensitization protocol is short-lived. The antibodies will naturally come back within two to three months of the treatment. So if no compatible donor lung becomes available in that time, then I would have to, the procedure would have to be repeated. Importantly, I have been told by all four centers that because of the talc fluoridesis, I would only be a candidate for a right lung transplant, and then I must stop Rapimune as soon as I am listed. None of these centers will consider me switching to Everlimus from Rapimune. I am fortunate that other than LAM, I'm, I am in very good health and have no signs of pulmonary hypertension. Of course, the question of deciding when to list has much to do with quality of life versus the risk of transplant, especially with the high antibodies and the like likelihood that the new organ would be rejected. I currently use four to five liters of oxygen depending on the activity. I still enjoy many outdoor interests and find that using my e-tank in a cart is an almost effortless accommodation on my part. So I'd say my quality of life right now is pretty good. I continue to be seen at the two centers periodically and constantly try to maintain a healthy lifestyle. I will say that one thing COVID taught me this spring is what it is like to focus on limiting contact with germs every single day. I consider that a good introduction to what the first phase of being post-transplant will be like. So while I continue to sit on the fence trying to decide when to list, I am encouraged by the promising lamb research that's going on, and I'm hopeful that the medical knowledge about the antibodies will continue to increase. I do recognize that my situation could change for the worse with very little notice. However, this past August, I asked the Pennsylvania Center to calculate my LAS score, uh, which they did. They did a mock-up and it is 34, which is very, very, very low. Therefore, I feel that I still have time to make an informed decision before it's too late. Thank you very much. Hey. Thank you, Karen. Really appreciate you sh sharing your personal decision process and all that you've experienced and, and, and really a, a very good point about the benefit of early evaluation um, in learning, yeah, about your uh, high antibody, HLA antibody count. So thank you very much. Lisa Catalano, um, you can go ahead and open your yeah, mic. Here. Are you there? Yes, I am. You? And we got your camera. Yay! Lisa is joining us from Punxsutawney, yep. Pennsylvania. Yay! <laughs> and um, I'm going to. Uh, Lisa's about two years out, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about what that transition from hospital to home and what her life has been like in this first couple of years. So thank you, Lisa, for being here tonight. Okay, um, I'm going to read what I printed. So if you want me to stop or have any questions, please have Shar. Just do it because Hi. everything I have to say is real. Okay, here we go, girls and doctor. Uh, my name's Lisa Catalano. I'm from Punxsutawney, PA. I just turned 54 this month. And I was diagnosed with LAM on May of 2018. And uh, my journey started October 15, 2018 at 3.21 a.m when I got the phone call for my second chance at life. It has been a roller coaster ride ever since. I was very fortunate to have my double lung transplant at UPMC Presby Hospital in Pittsburgh, PA. We were only two hours away, but it seemed 
so much longer than that on a special day. After my surgery, my transplant team helped me daily on learning how to take care of my medication by teaching me what each pill was for and that what were the side effects and how they would affect me. Then on November 3rd, the day after my birthday, I was, di I was discharged. And I would really like to talk about my real life after transplant. Okay, where do I begin? Do you really want me to start this? It's not gonna be happy. I made it through surgery, I'm home. I deal with no income. I deal with social security disability. I deal with welfare health insurance. I deal with home health and many other daily life issues that I had taken for granted. I've seen more doctors during this journey than I wanted to, but each one has been so kind, caring, and dedicated to me that I am so grateful. We used to think that going to Pittsburgh was a chore. Now we think of it as a little day trip. Our lives were so full of lots of blessings. My partner has difficulties in his life also. He has Crohn's, broken back, due to a car wreck, mile down the road from our home, cancer, two hip replacements on the same side. And it's just like, what do you do? I, I try to take it slow, but I have not felt this great in years. I can breathe, I am blessed. I keep exercising and sometimes it's hard. Then the stress starts, my appetite changes. I become afraid to drive. Sleep patterns are way out of sync. My realistic dreams start. My mind whirls. Am I sorting my pills correctly? Am I scheduling my appointments in Pittsburgh correctly? I keep telling myself not to overdo it. Should I do more? Shortly after my transplant, the bronchoscopies and PFTs start. I did well with PFTs, but not the bronchoscopies. After those, I would be white so wiped out that I would spend the rest of the week in bed <sighs> and my recovery progressed. My blood work kept changing, as did the doses of my anti-rejection drugs. I kept thinking I need an assistant <laughs> to help me with all this stuff, but I've learned to manage all this plus my family and our household. It takes time and reassurance for all of us. COVID hits our area. It's like really bad right now. I become more depressed. I was put on high doses of steroids to combat an infection. I gained 30 pounds. And let me tell you, steroid rage is real. <laughs> you have to laugh at it because it does help. My friends and family stay away due to the virus, so they don't give me anything. I, obsess, I am obsessed with germs. I'm constantly disinfecting our home. I don't go anywhere. But you know what? Then finally I come to terms with what's going on with the world and I take my life back. I will not let this defeat me. I have to give lots and lots of credit to my partner in life, Denny, and our families for all their love and support during and after the transplant. Also, my donor, my family, and I have the most wonderful transplant team, and of course, God. Keep playing for a cure, ladies. And please don't hesitate to ask me anything. If I can help, I will. I'm not ashamed to answer any questions. And thank you, the Lamb Foundation. And stay lamb strong, ladies. Love you all. Thank you so much, Lisa. And um, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Lisa and her partner, Denny, a bit over the last 20 years, or two years, rather. <laughs> and what I can tell you is every bit of spirit that you come in here coming out of her mouth tonight is exactly how she lives her life and it, it's really a joy so lisa thank you um for sharing Amen. and you'll be staying she'll be staying on and answering questions if you have them for her so and i and i want to just reiterate really quickly for those of you that may not have caught um at the very beginning of lisa's introduction there uh, she was diagnosed in may of 18 transplanted in october of 18 so that, that was the window and how quickly and still when it came time to help her get her tissue donated or anything I've asked her to do for the foundation. But she knows very little about lamb. You've had more experience with transplant at this point, right, um, than with lamb. And she is, she is this there for us and full of spirit. So Lisa, thank you very much.
again. No problem. Yeah. Stay strong, ladies. Thank <laughs> you, doctor. All right, Karen Shad, you're up. You would like to open your mic? There you are. Hey, thank you. Karen is coming to us from Colorado this evening, and she is one of those that's on the far end of the chart that Dr. Uh, Dilling showed us tonight in terms of survival. And Karen, um, I won't steal your thunder, so go ahead and tell us where you are in your journey. <laughs> thank you well, for being so here. So I'm going to start with um, diagnosis, how I got diagnosed. It took a very long time because there wasn't anybody studying lamb in the beginning. So um, I live in Broomfield, Colorado. I live at the elevation of 5,344 feet. And I have a condo in the mountains at 9,000 feet, which is how I started figuring out something was wrong with me. My journey to diagnosis started with the crazy, awful headaches I used to get when we would go to our condo in the mountains. It took many, many, many years to go to diagnosis what they were from. I kept going to doctors and nobody could figure it out. I had two lung collapses. I had one on my daughter's first birthday um, and I went to the doctor because I waited, waited, waited. So both lung, it, the lung was totally collapsed. Only one, but totally collapsed. And um, when I went to the doctor, I said, before you take an x-ray, I think I'm pregnant. So that's how I started out. They still didn't know what LAM was. And so in 1982, I had another collapse, still not knowing that I had LAM. Um, in 1999, I had to have kidney surgery because there was an AML on my kidney and the, um, it had burst and I was bleeding in, internally. They, they removed, I only let them remove part of my kidney. I refused to have my full kidney removed um, and still wasn't diagnosed with anything. And then in um, my declining PFTs had gotten so bad that the doctor I kept doing my PFTs at finally put two and two together in, um, which was 10 years after my kidney surgery and said, you have lamb. And it was the old days. So he said, and you'll be lucky if you live 10 years. And of course I cried forever in his office. Um, and luckily I went past that 10 years. I, it took almost, let me see, diagnosed in 2009, but I had my first sign of it in, two, in 1980. Had my transplant in 2009. It was down to 8% lung function. Um, waiting in Colorado and never got called after five years of waiting. So I called, um, I looked east and chose Duke because it was close to Susie. Because <laughs> um, I thought, you know, somebody would know me. And uh, they took me immediately and I had my transplant um, 17 days after they put me on the list. I um, had to live there for three months after transplant, but I was doing so well at two months, I begged to go home and come back at the end of the next month, which they let me do. And um, I'm now 11 and a half years out as of yesterday. And I wanted to talk to everybody mostly tonight about fears, fears before transplant, fears after transplant, fears we live with all the time. And, and we all adjust differently to those fears. And um, I'm going to read what I wrote because it's better than me trying to, I'll talk forever if I don't do that. <laughs> so do the fears we have, we couldn't, well, the fears I had was that I couldn't breathe or you can't breathe. And, and do they ever go away, those fears after transplant? For me, the answer is yes and no. Since I'm 11 and a half years out as of yesterday, Yay, I do have issues. I have been in chronic rejection for the last four years, and the word rejection is scary enough to hear. I have continued to enjoy life. I have continued since three years into transplant of traveling around the world in all kinds of places. I've ridden a bike through Spain. I've, I, I've been everywhere, you don't need the list, but I've been to a lot of places and I continue to this day to keep traveling till COVID started. I was breathing, taking deep breaths, walking without issues, running up and down stairs and traveling the world 
doing all I wanted to do without much of a thought about where my breasts were coming from. I am just living, but there are always those days that my thoughts say I'd better check my pulse ox. Life presents those fears. What we do with those fears is what makes life interesting and for me better. I love to confront those fears and then move on. We can let our fears take over our daily life or we can choose to move forward and do the things we love most. For many of us, transplants have its ups and downs and I personally would not have done anything different. And I was going to read to you as though those of you have, have read my book have probably read that part. I wrote a book um, about my journey. My husband and I wrote a book about our journey through Lamb. And from, he, he probably wrote most of it, but I put in my thoughts, so it's his thoughts, my thoughts. But at the end of the book, I say, I learned not to worry about things. And I, this was written, I don't know, in the third year. I learned not to worry about things I cannot control. I believe things take their own course. Happened for a reason. I was not always that way. I used to think I could control everything. I'm much happier for having stopped trying. I have no control over much of what happens to me in my life, but I do have control over how I react to it. Looking for the answers to why me is futile, for there are answers to, to the what now. Once I took responsibility for my reactions, I was free to live again making the best of experiences, the wake of dawn and giving it meaning, that's my choice. That was not an easy lesson. Just try to stay in the moment. I'm not afraid to die. I just do not want to. I love life that you gave me and living, which I was writing it to my donor, if you want to know who you is. I would trade these gains for a longer life without lamb and transplant, but they are pretty good consolation prizes. I have learned too, so much and lived so much. You can be told about lamb, about lung disease, about lung transplant, but unless you live it, it won't mean much. I was here and I lived through this, and this is what I learned. You just can't put an old head on young shoulders. I guess what I'm really talking about is some way to tell those who follow in my footsteps, you're not alone. Thank you. Ah, Karen, thank you very thank much. You. Um, beautiful words and beautiful hearts. Thank you for sharing. Wow. Um, whew, there's a lot there, ladies. Thank you so much. I'm looking at the time. I think that what we'll do is go ahead and transition to group discussion, our patient and family group discussion. And we can, our panelists can take questions there. And as I mentioned previously, we also have our uh, more recent transplant recipients on the call as well with us tonight. Um, but before we part, we will let um, Dr. Dilling uh, log off if he chooses to, to <laughs> right at this point. It's been a long day, I'm sure. But um, I hope, Dr. Dilling, you've had a chance to scroll through the chat a little bit and panelists um, as well, because the, the comments um, are inspiring and you are inspiring. So thank you very much. Again, Dr. Dilling, we appreciate you beyond words. And um, thank you. And we are wishing you health and good health and safety through this next week's and the holidays. And um, we'll be in touch soon. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much.